Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this day and for the opportunity to consider some of the prophetic developments that are taking place around us. And we pray for your presence and your blessing as we uh, look at these things, these prophetic things today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation 18. Revelation chapter 18. I would like you to notice something about the economic rulers of the world. The Bible says in verse 11 that the merchants of the earth, these are the ones who rule the economy. These are the ones who organize the central banks and control the, uh, d- the domestic affairs of nations as well as international relations. Uh, these are the mega corporations who sell their products worldwide or often uh, a large section of the world. The merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. Why are they going to weep and mourn? It's because Rome is going to be punished. Verse 4 tells us that I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. In other words, Babylon, spiritual Babylon, which, of course, is described in Scripture. You know, it's interesting The Bible doesn't name the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible doesn't name the United States of America. The Bible doesn't name the Seventh-day Adventist Church or other churches. The Bible doesn't name these entities because if the Bible named them, then what would happen? They would choose another name, especially if they're condemned by Scripture. So they would choose another name. The Bible doesn't name the Jesuits. It doesn't give a clear name for these entities because they would not then use those names. And from time to time, different names would come and go and the whole thing would become very obscure. The Bible doesn't name them. The Bible describes them. So when the Bible describes these entities, we can then determine which entities comply with the description, the ideas or the principles of the description that you find in Scripture. So when you study spiritual Babylon and you compare that with the the religious churches of the world today, there's only one church that fits. There's only one church that has a global system of worship that is capable of establishing a religious world order. And that's the Roman Catholic Church. You can read about her in chapter 17 and chapter 18 of Revelation. And it says that Rome is going to be punished for her sins, in verse 5, have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. Don't think that the child sex scandals and the uh, monasteries and nunneries of this world that have that have abused children are going to go unpunished. Right now they get a lot of media because they're, the people are being shocked by this. They didn't think that a church that would have such religious garb would be so corrupt. Don't think that the banking scandals of the Vatican are going to go unpunished because it's more than just a scandal that involves this one individual or that one individual. It's a systemic principle that Rome is using to manipulate and control the economies of the world. And consequently, Rome is engaged and manipulates and involves itself with the merchants of the earth. So when the Bible says the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn, there's a reason why. Let's read on from verse 15, uh, verse 14, pardon me. 
<clears throat> the Bible says they stand afar off in verse 10. The merchants of the earth weep and mourn. And then verse 14 says, The fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. Do you think the Bible means what it says? Of course it does. So in other words, the things that made these nations, or rather these merchants of the earth, that made them collaborate with Babylon, spiritual Babylon, because they get the benefit of it, they're going to disappear and they're going to weep and mourn as a result. Now verse 15. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for fear of their torment, weeping and wailing. In other words... The punishment that comes on Rome for the abuse of this world, its finances, its people, these things will also affect the merchants of the earth. So they distance themselves. They weep and mourn. They are made rich. They, they involve themselves with Rome because Rome makes them rich. And when that stops happening, there's going to be a crisis. Look, look what happens. Verse 16. They say, Alas, alas, that great city that, hath clothed, that was clothed with fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. If ever there was a place that was decked with precious stones and pearls and gold and silver and scarlet, etc., it would be the Vatican, the papacy. Verse 17, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught. You think Donald Trump is rich? <laughs> He's a pauper compared to Rome, compared to the Pope. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors, as many as trade by sea, stood afar off. And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this city? You see, there's no description anywhere that is any more distinct than the description that you read in the Bible of Rome. And then verse 19, it says, They cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich, all that dwell in ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. So, my friends, I want you to notice that the bankers will have a great crisis, especially the central bankers of the earth. Those who manage and manipulate the money system are engaged with Rome. They've collaborated with the Vatican to achieve enormous wealth. They manipulate the economy to enrich themselves. And it's like a game to many of them. And while you and I struggle to make a few coins to rub together, they are living high on the hog, as we say in English. They suck the life out of your assets by manipulating the currencies, by taxation, and by the control of inflation and of economic flows of the world. They bleed your economic potential and hand it to a few bankers and a few merchants that control the whole system. And while this sounds unbelievable, it actually happens to be true. And the more digitized a nation's economy is, the easier it is for banks to impose negative interest rates. Have you ever heard of negative interest? That means that you pay an interest on the amount of money that you hold in the bank. And you don't pay it to yourself, you pay it to the bank. They take it from you. In other words, instead of the bank paying you interest for your deposit, you pay them. You are the, you are the one who loans them the money, so to speak. And if you're forced to keep all your funds in a digital account or in a digital format, Banks can then impose negative interest rates and suck out more of your financial wealth than you could possibly imagine. And it's as upside down as you can get. Sweden, Denmark, Switzerland, they already have negative interest rates. 
and their economy is already almost completely digital. Your economy is already almost completely digital. Many shops don't want your cash anymore. They just want your phone to tap on their payment system or some credit card to slide through the payment, the payment uh, place. But even the U.S. Federal Reserve has recently talked about negative interest rates. You see, negative interest rates could not exist in a free market. They destroy motivation to save and build capital, which is the basis of prosperity. If you don't like that plan, you can stash your cash under your bed. But cash limits how far the government and central banks can go with negative interest rates. The more cash there is, the less possibility of negative interest. The more it costs to store money in your bank, the less inclined people are to do it. What do they do with it instead? They keep it in their safe, or they put it under their mattress, or in some other way. Well, <clears throat> central planners, um, by the way, central planners is another name for communist. Did you know that? It's just another name for, it's a nice sounding name for communist. Of course, central planners don't want you to withdraw your money from the bank. This is the big reason why they want to eliminate cash. So long as you can't withdraw your money, then they control you, you see. They want everybody to have a bank account. And as long as your money stays in the bank, it's, value, it's vulnerable to the sting of negative interest rates. And it helps to prop up the unsound fractional service reserve banking system. So if you can't withdraw cash, you have two choices. You can accept negative interest rates or you can spend your money. You can't save it. Well, you can, but I mean, it'll cost you. Ultimately, that's what central planners want. They want, you to, they want to use negative interest rates to force you to spend your money or otherwise have it taken from you a little at a time. The war on cash and negative interest rates are huge threats to your financial security and your liberty. Liberty, that's the key. Central planners want to take away your liberty. And the easiest way to do that is to control your money. But why do central bankers and governments on earth want to control your money? Well, it's money that makes the world go round. Money to these merchants is everything because they're getting rich by it. They have vested interests in controlling it. They use the economic system to their advantage. And consequently, when they have all the cash under their control, they can manipulate you and the system even more. But most of all, governments can control their citizens. By removing cash from society, governments are bringing your financial transactions under the radar. When they bring all the economy into the digital environment, it gives them complete control over everything that goes on in your life, or nearly everything. They know that most people cannot live without at least some money. They know that if they have all your money under control, they can track you and manipulate you into compliance with the new world order so that you are not free. You may feel like you're free, and those who want to sin will have no trouble sinning. But those who want to live for Christ will not be free to do so. It will strengthen globalization so that it can be enforced more easily. A cashless economy gives the government the ability to central plan everything for you. And like communism, it gives an even democratic government complete control over its citizens. Often the media uses a curious sounding word, as I said, called po policy makers, which is really just controllers. But this is where religious freedom comes into it. 
While governments and central banks are collaborating to organize a digital economy and forcing it on the nations, creating more centralization of power in a globalized world, the papacy is standing by, ready to enforce her religion on all when she has the opportunity. Well, no wonder Revelation 13, 8 says that all the world shall wonder after the beast. Sorry, verse, verse 3 says all that dwell... All the, all the world wonders after the beast. Verse 8 says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship the beast. Those who wonder after the beast will be amazed at how much control she has over their lives. And they will worship her because they are part of the system. They've chosen to link their lives in with this social order that is being developed and uh, by coercion, that is economic coercion, they will comply. They can't envision leaving the economic system and being reduced to the barter system so that they cannot survive other than with barter. Friends, this is why God tells us that we need to have our own system. Do you know what God's system is to survive? God does not need for you to have a big bank account. God does not need for you to have a retirement pension. Sometimes that's useful. And I'm not saying we shouldn't use it while ever it's available to us. But God needs your heart. And then He gives you survival. Did you know that? The only way that God can really help you survive especially the final crisis, is if you give your heart to Jesus Christ. You understand what I'm saying? The economic system is going to work against you if you're faithful to Jesus Christ. So God has a plan. First of all, it's to give your heart to Christ. But secondly, to learn some medical missionary work. Did you know what, you know what medical missionary work is? Medical missionary work is... The ability to minister to people, to help them with their needs. Whenever you help somebody with a need, whether it's a health need or a physical need or an economic need, you're a medical missionary. That's the definition. A medical missionary is someone who can help people with their needs. And then those people say to them, well, would you like a bag of carrots? Would you like a, a bag of peppers? Or a bag of potatoes? Thank you for your help. And then you can eat. That's God's survival plan. To help somebody else. And guess what? They help you. It's a principle of philanthropy. If you give, Jesus says, it will be given unto you. Give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together and running over. You'll have too many sacks of potatoes. You won't be able to eat them all. Sounds good, doesn't it? God's plan is to get you to be independent of the social infrastructure of the world. That's his plan. Anyway, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. The merchants of the earth are already collaborating with the Vatican so that when the time comes, they'll be ready to enforce the papal worship plan. Did you hear that? They will be ready to enforce what? the papal worship plan. And the technology men are part of it too. <clears throat> Without them, the digital economy wouldn't work. So the banks, the technology companies, they work together. And the Vatican, they all work together. No wonder that it was important to the Pope to have contact with men like Eric Schmidt. Do you know who Eric Schmidt is? Eric Schmidt is the CEO of Alphabet. Now, Alphabet is not very well known to most people, but it is a massive company that owns other companies. The one you know very well is Google. Eric Schmidt visited the Pope last year, and they had a discussion. He also, however, around the same time, met with a man named Tim Cook. Who's he? He's the CEO of Apple. And he also met with Kevin Systrom. Do you know who Kevin Systrom is? 
He is the founder of a, of a social media company known as Instagram. Uh-huh. See, the Pope has an interest in this technology, not because he uses it himself. He, he does some, perhaps. But really because it's about controlling the digital world. Because if you don't control the digital world, you're not going to be able to control the economy. And unless you control the economy, you cannot control the religion of the world. Francis also met with a woman named Christine Lagarde. Does anybody know who Christine Lagarde is? She is the director of the IMF, or the International Monetary Fund. You've heard of that, right? Christine Lagarde is the one behind that. No wonder the Pope has an interest in her, because she's in charge of the money distribution to poor nations. You see, the, 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 the International Monetary Fund gives money into the control of corrupt leaders of banana republics, for instance, and other struggling nations who, make some, uh, who take some of it and hide it in shell companies for themselves in protected places. The Pope has also had audiences with Jim Young Kim, president of the World Bank. No surprise there either, is there? Mario Draghi, president of the European Central Bank. No surprise there either, is there? And he's met with others. You see, the economy is very important to the Vatican. If Rome is ever going to get the world to worship in her way, she has to control the money because most people worship money. Oh, oh, there's a connection there, isn't there? You worship money, you're going to end up worshiping the Pope because the Pope is the God of money. If she's ever going to enforce her worship, she has to collaborate with global corporations and individual CEOs to get rid of cash or at least minimize the use of cash, so that governments and businesses will be able to enforce her will and will collaborate with her on enforcing her will on the people in exchange for making them rich. If you don't collaborate, you'll be out of the business and you won't be able to get rich anymore. So they'll collaborate. That's why the Vatican is an organization that pushes globalization. Because globalization is all about collaboration to get, the world, to get these money men even more wealthy than they are. But the larger and more global solutions are being developed to remove your liberty and independence and get everyone on the so-called economic grid so that every transaction can be tracked through the international banking conglomerates and by governments. Every transaction. Once the controls are in place, the enemy of souls can then bring in the reign of the mark of the beast and enforce it with a no-buy, no-sell law. Revelation 13, 16, and 17 tells us that. In other words, unless you accept the mark of the beast... You won't be able to buy or sell. You can't conduct transactions. You won't be able to walk into a store or a shop and buy even a pack of chewing gum. You will be unable to buy fuel. <clears throat> you will not be able to heat your home. You will not be able to pay your electric bill or your mortgage. In other words, you won't have any place to live. You won't have any place to go. And if you don't have cash and your bank assets are frozen, which refers to your money being locked and inaccessible, you're stuck. The infrastructure for this is already essentially in place. Does that sound scary? <laughs> Friends, in Christ there is no fear. Christ has a plan for your survival. If you follow His word, if you live by His principles, He has a plan for your survival. And you don't need to worry about what happens in the economy and in the cash and all those things that we're talking about today. This is a prophetic issue. This is a prophetic issue that we need to watch and that we need to track. But it's not to scare us. It's to help us wake up so that we see where we are in the stream of time and that we're really close to the coming of Christ. 
But the bottom line is that you have to choose to rely on Christ or fall under the enemy's dominance. You have a choice, of course. You can always choose to come under the enemy. Will that help you? No. That's not in your best interest. Your best interest is to follow Christ. And then, yes, you won't necessarily have a lot of economic standing and status in this world. But you will have God's blessing. And you'll have eternal life, which is far more greater weight of glory than what you get in the glory of this world. The gold and the silver and the fine linens and purple and scarlet and gold that Rome likes to talk about so much. That's an amazing experience, though, to be, to be dependent on Christ exclusively. Most of us like to be in control of ourselves. But Christ says, let me control your life. If you are going to be dependent on Christ, ultimately he wants to provide you even your bread and water. You think you need your pension or your pay packet or your salary to pay for your bread and your water. But God proposes that in the last days he will do that for you without having to go to work or without receiving your pension packet. You see what I'm saying? His goal is to get you completely dependent on Him. And if you are completely reliant on Christ and to, to survive from day to day, then He has you where He wants you. And the enemy has no control over you. That's the goal. That's the real issue that we have to face in the last days is the choice of whether we're going to come under Christ completely or whether we're going to live under the system of this world. It's not something that most people are ready to do, are they? In fact, uh, most people would be freaked out by this, that kind of proposition. But that's what Jesus proposes to do. Your bread and water will be sure, the Bible says. Most people are used to earning money so that they can... Uh, pay their bills and they're used to their cash or their credit card or their smartphone to get their groceries. Do you think God might have to feed you one day like he fed Elijah under the juniper tree in the wilderness? <laughs> yeah. You see, it's very hard on us if we don't have control over our own lives. We can easily get discouraged like Elijah was discouraged when he was threatened by Jezebel because that's what's going to happen. You and I are going to be threatened by Jezebel and we're going to end up out there in the wilderness and God's going to have to feed us like he fed Elijah. Now think about that for a minute. Elijah ate that food twice and he went on the strength of that food for how long? Forty days and forty nights. He didn't have to eat again for more than a month. Wow. That's some kind of food, isn't it? That's real food. That's not food that you have to eat three times a day in order to survive. Well, probably two times a day. It's probably good enough for most of us. No, no, that's not that kind of food. That's food that'll last you more than a month, 40 days. That's the kind of food I like to eat. How about you? Friends, if you don't learn to become dependent on Christ now, how will you ever be ready to depend on Him then? I'm not saying we shouldn't use the system that's out there. I'm just saying that you must not be dependent on the system that's out there. Your dependence is to be on Christ, and that's very hard to do when you're dependent on the system, or rather when you are engaged with the system. You see, when God gives you an opportunity to trust Him, why do we whine and complain? Why do we react? You see, Christ knows what you need even before you actually need it. He gives you grace to hold on even when it seems impossible to do so. Friends, I know what that's like. There have been times in my life when I've been completely without resources. 
I've had no options, no choices, no place to turn. I could only turn to Christ. And in times of trouble, we must automatically, we must learn to automatically turn to Christ. I'm very serious about what I'm saying. I believe we must learn the meaning of real trust. Unless we do, we will be caught up in the overwhelming surprise that will take the world captive by Satan's snares. And the economy is very much a part of it. Your cash and your digital worth is very much involved with that. Here's a statement from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 28. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world. And a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. We who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. Think about that. The overwhelming surprise. Most people have no idea that it's coming. But God in His Word has given us an indication that there is coming an overwhelming surprise and what to do about it. It's not just that God tells us about it. It's that He explains how to navigate it, how to get through it. That's the important thing about the Bible. But that overwhelming surprise involves cash. Until cash is controlled... Bible prophecy will not be completely fulfilled. And when it is, God's faithful people will be reduced to the barter system overnight. Most people will freak out when that happens. How will they survive? How will they pay their obligations, their debts, and their mortgages? How will they, how will they pay their credit card? How will they support their children's education? How will they plan for retirement? Friends, I dare say that there are many of God's people who have no idea what is coming upon them. And I'll guarantee you there's a lot of them right here in Denmark. They continue planning for a life of ease and tranquility, but they don't realize that there is a storm brewing that will be to them an overwhelming surprise. But all of that is the big picture. Let's talk about the way this impacts us in our daily life. Smartphones with smart software can now be used to pay for things at the checkout counter. How many of you have used a smartphone to pay for something? Most of us, or many of us anyway. You don't have to carry around a credit card anymore, let alone cash. Just your smartphone is all you need which you then authorize with your fingerprint. Did you know that? Your smartphone is authorized. You open it and unlock it by your fingerprint. Maybe some of you have already used these types of transactions. They will only increase as time goes on. Technology is already being tested to have all items on the shelf of the shops to be RFID compatible. In other words, all you have to do is pass your whole cart or trolley by the checkout counter. You don't have to put every item up on there and let them scan it like they do now. The whole cart or trolley can just go right past the checkout counter and it tallies everything up. You simply pay with your, your phone or your card and out comes the receipt. It's that simple. It's getting easier all the time. Maybe um, some of you have already noticed that there is uh, some of these RFID-compatible packaging on the shop shelves. In other words, all you have to do is, is uh, use the system and you become used to it. And it's so easy that we naturally are drawn to it. There's no need to, for the cashier to scan each item individually anymore. Just... Bingo, it's done, like magic. Well, hold on. With all that technology, also goes your freedom, or much of it, and much of your privacy also. Perhaps a lot more than you realize, and a lot more than you want to give up, ultimately. When pizza is delivered to your door, 
the driver will have a smart device that you can tap with your phone and the pizza's paid for. The same will happen with other deliveries. Airlines already use scanners to track your and report on your baggage, check your boarding pass, and have payment devices for your credit card and when you buy onboard food. Vending machines and toll roads are increasingly cashless. Immigration in many countries uses RFID technology to process passengers. Paper use is down wherever these technologies exist, and technologies are being developed to wipe out your need for cash altogether. The aim of the globalists is to get rid of cash. And they're pushing this really hard. Just recently, some of the very wealthiest people on the planet were invited to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Ever heard of the World Economic Forum? This was their annual economic discussion to forecast trends and try to understand <clears throat> the things that are coming in the world that affect them and their prospects for getting even more wealth. The Davos meeting is a very important yearly event for these super rich individuals. Do you know what a super rich person is? That's a person who's way above, economically way above most of the people on the planet and even way above the, some of the wealthiest people on the planet. They're, so, they're, they're super rich. They're not just rich, they're super rich. Now the super rich have their ways of hiding their assets. You probably know about that. They go to some island protectorate off the coast of um, France or England or in the Caribbean or in some other place. Um, or they go to Panama, another safe haven for privacy. These countries have laws that protect privacy very strongly. They put their money in a shell company. They, they find a law firm there, and the law firm creates a shell company. And they put their assets in that shell company. Then they have an agreement with the law firm that the agent for the shell company that manages the shell company is one of the staff members in their office. And their agreement with you is that they will do what you tell them to do with the money or with the assets that are in your shell company. Then they create another shell company that that shell company is owned by. And then they create another shell company and another shell company so that they're all nested together like one Russian doll. And they control it all on your behalf as the super rich person. So if you want to hide your money from the tax department or from the justice department, you just put it in a shell company. And then they can't find it because they can't get into the, they can't get through the privacy, the legal privacy that these countries have. It's a beautiful little tool that is used by very wealthy people to control or hide their assets. They put their properties they put their houses, they put their apartment flats that they rent out, they put all of their business assets in these shell companies. And they don't have any money of themselves, personally. It's not about ownership. It's about control. That's what the super rich do, all right? That lays some foundation. These super rich people come to this Davos meeting. No doubt there are many there who worship money and they hoard it in their secret shell companies around the world. This conclave of high priests of monetary policy almost invariably sings the same chorus that only criminals and terrorists use high denominations of cash. This useful mantra gets people to think that they need to get rid of cash. It doesn't matter that it's actually not true. Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel laureate and economist, made a few remarks at the meeting which would shock you, perhaps. He suggested, for instance, that the United States get rid of its $100 bills. 
But he also said they should get rid of their $50 bills and their $20 bills and their $10 bills, their $5 bills, and even their nearly worthless $1 bills. Stiglitz thinks that regular people don't need paper money. As usual, he made the claim that cash is only useful for drug dealers, terrorists, tax evaders, and money launderers. Of course, that's not the whole story. ISIS, for example, is famously known for using other forms of um, of of assets. Okay, for instance, um, as the United States and Russia and other countries are bombing and destroying millions of dollars in cash in their airstrikes, it hasn't affected their activities much. This notorious terrorist group famously uses both the, old, the world's oldest currency, which is what? Gold, thank you, somebody say it. <laughs> and the world's newest currency, which is? Bitcoin. Somebody got it. Very good. So gold and Bitcoin. An unregulated, Bitcoin is an unregulated digital cryptocurrency. It is, by the way, on government radar. They don't like it. But it is a medium of exchange that they cannot control. That's why they don't like it. The U.S. Treasury Secretary, or former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, also thinks that cash is no longer needed. He said it's totally convincing the linkage between high denomination notes and crime. And that it's important to stop the use of high denomination notes, making it harder for criminals to ply their trade. But the elimination of high denomination notes is just one step away from the elimination of lower denomination notes and eventually all cash altogether. And while these globalists parrot the old line that cash only facilitates illegal activity and illicit activity, nowadays drug dealers, prostitutes, and other criminals or other seedy individuals, they accept credit cards. <laughs> you can pay for your, your weed by credit card. You can pay for your escapade with a prostitute with a credit card. No worries. You see, the crime or the bad things in this world are not going to go away. Whenever you're selling on the street corner hot dogs or marijuana, there are many payment solutions like Stripe, Square, PayPal, Apple Pay, and others that allow anyone to accept those credit card payments. <coughs> but the elites have a reason why they continue the refrain that the, and the idea that all the scumbags of the world will disappear if we take away the cash. They know that most good trusting people will believe this line, especially if, that is re if it is repeated enough. Fear, especially fear of terrorists, but also fear, other fears, drives much of what we do. So, most elites, including government rulers, have jumped on the, the cash ban bandwagon. Removing cash from society isn't about solving tax in evasion or crime. There will still be plenty of that. It's not about illegal activity. There will still be plenty of that. It's about totalitarianism, my friends. Taking away your liberty, your power of choice, and your freedom to live as you please. That's what it's about. And now after the Cyprus crisis, remember the crisis in Cyprus? You should know that when you deposit your money in a bank, it is no longer yours. You may think it's yours, but it's not. Not legally speaking. You are merely an unsecured creditor. 
and they have the power to freeze you out of your life savings without even giving you a courtesy call. Wow. It's, surveillance is part of this too, you know. The elites want a massive centralized bureaucracy to have control over your savings. It's deeper than surveillance and tracking. It's something of which even these economic high priests are not aware. Yeah, not even the super rich realize what this is really all about. And this is something very prophetic. They cannot scare you into compliance with the global worship laws if they don't get control of every transaction that you make. They would even like to control the barter if they could. But they can't. So perhaps barter will be the only way for the underground transactions to occur when the digital economy is in full swing. At least that's if the elites have their way. Apparently the time has come to push for a cashless world. And it's happening in many places. Keep the Faith Ministry has been tracking and keeping track of this process since 2003. Since when? 2003. We continually report on this whenever something prophetically significant or newsworthy comes to our attention. Starting with the drive for less, less cash, it will eventually become a drive for no cash. Shortly after the Davos meeting in 2016, the European Commission established, or rather published, a letter to the Council of Europe about their action plan. This is the European Commission. It's talking about their action plan to further step up the fight against terrorism or the financing of terrorism, which is elite speak for eliminating cash, among other things, of course. The war on cash is happening at a faster rate than most of us realize, and that more than we could have imagined, far faster than we could have imagined 20 years ago. Every time we turn around, there seems to be another assault on cash, and it's a technology-driven assault on cash. India is the most notable example in which the Narendra government, <coughs> the Narendra Modi government, stunned the nation by demonetizing its two largest denominations of cash. The 500 and 1,000 rupee notes. And they did this overnight, leaving the entire nation in chaos. Modi is shoving millions of street vendors, leaving, uh, or rather, into cashless transactions and, of course, a corresponding economic crisis. People don't buy their products right now because they don't have cash. It's taking them a long time to get this all sorted out. But at first, it was especially excruciating for the Indian people. Modi's surprise unilateral announcement hatched secretly in the back room of his own home with a few, a small group of high-level insiders wiped out 86% of the nation's currency overnight, leaving the vendors at markets to suffer great losses. It also pushed millions of new users into the country's digital economic grid by virtual fiat, forcing them to set up digital payment systems with which they were unfamiliar, even though most of their customers do not have the capability to make digital payments themselves. They lack their own bank accounts in many cases. Modi intends to shove India like a leapfrog into a less cash use economy on par with more developed nations, or even perhaps more advanced than some developed nations. <coughs> Modi's rhetoric has changed since the original late night announcement on November 8 last year. Instead of fighting black money crime and terrorism, T 
to creating a cashless society altogether. In other words, at first he was talking about dealing with the black market. But now, instead of the black market, it still has the black market, by the way. <laughs> now, he's talking about creating a cashless society. And this is India, where people aren't educated. They don't understand how to use these new technology devices. They are learning very quickly, needless to say. But it's forcing them to have some serious economic challenges in the meantime. Many Western countries are already largely ready for the less cash move. Larry Summers thinks that the nations of the world should eliminate high denominations notes. He recently wrote that nothing in the Indian experience gives us pause in recommending that no more large notes be created in the United States, in Europe, and around the world. In other words, Summers thinks that the United States should curtail its $100 bill and that Europe should curtail its 500 euro note, maybe even its 100 euro note as well. The United States is essentially digitally ready for cashless. Very few Americans carry much cash with them anymore. I think it's the same or even more so here in Denmark, don't you? They have been incentivized to use their credit cards through points programs, airline miles, and yes, even cash back on purchases. And it's beginning to appear that people don't care if they can't spend cash. More and more shops have turned to a no cash model. It's more common than you think. The internet is all no cash. The airlines are often no cash and also many shops in the marketplace are no cash. So even some parking lots don't even take cash anymore. And though the no cash model is still an oddity, that is going to change. I think we're sort of on the edge of seeing more and more businesses who don't take cash, said Jay Zagorski, an economist from Ohio State University. There's even a trend away from paper checks to digital transactions. The United States has already discontinued using the $500 uh, dollar note. Canada has stopped producing its $1,000 note. Singapore stopped issuing its 10,000 ringgit note. And in a world where legal commerce is increasingly conducted via electronic payment systems, eliminating high denomination notes makes sense to these elites because it is a natural step toward a cashless economy. Australia is almost cashless now. Electronic non-cash transactions have soared and check payments in Australia have declined dramatically and are now a dying payment form. And since Australia is to implement a new uh, payment system in 2018, the use of checks will decline even further. That new payment system, by the way, is a way to make a transfer of cash through digital equipment that is instant. There's no float time. It's an instant transaction. They're already getting very close to it. Um, as you know, I have ministry work in Australia, two health retreats, and we needed to buy a car for one of our organizations. Um, I found a car, and I went and tested the car out, and I decided to buy it. <laughs> the man said to me, how are you going to pay for it? I said, I'll pay for it by digital transaction. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'll make a bank transfer. He said, what bank do you use? I said, I use the ANZ bank. He said, oh, that's the same bank I use. So... He agreed to let me try it. So I typed in the amount into my account on my digital device, and he had his digital device open, and I pushed the transfer button, and it showed up on his account instantly. It had not cleared. It took a, 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 an overnight clearance, but it was, it was already shown on his account as incoming uh, money. I thought that was rather interesting, and that really showed me how close Australia is really to a digital economy. 
The drive to reduce cash in Australia is going on full steam. Bankers are starting to use Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, and the bank's own internal payment systems built right into their apps. Citibank has decided to stop dealing in cash at at least some of its local branches in Australia. Banks, regulators, and payment companies want to see cash go away. And its use, as its use declines, the cost of making, distributing, and handling cash also rises. So there's going to be increasing pressure to get rid of cash. Plus, governments want better control over taxation, more effective means of fighting fraud and other crimes, and of course, fighting crime is good so long as it's actual crime. But what about when an activity that has never before been a crime suddenly becomes one? Like, for instance, some forms of worship or Sabbath keeping. Supermarket customers in Britain are being offered the chance to pay for their shopping by using only their fingerprint. What? How does that work? Well, the BBC told us this. They said, starting all the way back in 2006, three co-op stores in the Oxford area were starting to offer a service, a new service. It said that to be... It was the first of its kind in Europe. Um, Shoppers don't need to carry cash or cards and not even a phone in order to buy something at the shop. All they do is link their fingerprint to their bank account. And when they come to the shop, there is a, a scanner that reads their fingerprint and checks their bank account and withdraws the money when they finish the transaction. Wow, that's interesting. They don't even need to remember PIN numbers anymore. The new system allows customers to have finger scan linked to their bank details so payments for goods can be taken directly from their accounts, said the BBC. It is free to use for customers who can register at home, on the Internet, or at participating stores. Could we soon have the ability to bypass the ID card or coordinated driver's license altogether? How easy would it be to link the fingerprint to all government details, as well as all shops and banking, any kind of transaction thing that you need to do? Just use your fingerprint. The leaders in going cashless are actually Scandinavian countries. Did you know that? Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Cash transactions now make only 2% of the value of all payments in Sweden. 2%, that's all. And only 6% of transactions in Norway. I don't know what that is in in, uh, Denmark, but it's very small. Um, Retailers and services are increasingly eliminating cash so that Swedes and other Scandinavians are used to cashless payments. For instance, Swedish buses have not taken cash for many years. To buy a ticket in Stockholm Metro with cash is impossible. And retailers are legally entitled to refuse coins and notes. Of Sweden's 1,600 banks, 900 of them no longer accept cash deposits or keep cash on hand. And many rural branches no longer have ATMs that spit out cash whenever you need it. Over the last year, circulation of Swedish krona fell to 80 billion from 106 billion in one year. 16 billion krona less in cash transactions. I think in practice, Sweden will pretty much be a cashless society within about five years, said Nicholas Arvidsson, associate professor of Stockholm's Royal Institute of Technology. They go together, technology and digital payments. 
Cards, the main form of payment, are now used three times more in Sweden and in, in Scandinavia than in the rest of Europe. But mobile apps have also taken off as technology has become more ubiquitous. Swish. Anybody ever heard of Swish? Swish is a hugely popular app with over 9 million payments a month that allows customers to transfer money between banks in real time. That's exactly what they're going to be doing in Australia in 2018. Real time bank transactions. Swish is pretty much killed cash for most people as far as person-to-person -person payments are concerned. You can pay anyone, not just a registered store. You can pay someone else by your phone, you know? I don't know how it works, but maybe two phones get together, they log in, and bingo, the transaction is done between two individuals. So in other words, if a drug dealer wants to sell you something on the street, he puts his phone out there, you tap your phone on his, and the payment is made. It's going to be easy to get drugs. And anything else, for that matter. The food in the supermarket, the uh, electronics in the, in the electronics store, whatever it is, it's going to be very easy to get from a cash point of view, or from a, from a digital money point of view. Mobile apps with mini card readers attached to the phone are now very common. You have a swiper, a little device that you plug into the phone and it swipes your card and you can take a payment right on your phone with a card, with a credit card. Churches all have also adopted cashless payments with one church reporting 85% of their donations are made by phone. Sweden's Nordic neighbors, Norway, Denmark, Finland, are also fast becoming almost completely and entirely cashless societies. That's you. It won't be long, folks, till you don't even have cash anymore. Israel has established a special committee to study methods of bringing Israel into a cashless society. They've recommended a three-phase plan to essentially do away with cash transactions in Israel. The reason for examining a cashless economy, says the government, as usual, is to combat money laundering, tax evasion, potential tax evasion, and also to expand the tax base, and I suppose fight terrorism as well. Israel's especially strong on terrorism. The committee recommends greater restrictions on the use of cash limiting the use of checks and promotion of electronic payments. Their plan involves gradual limiting of tra cash transactions for businesses immediately to 2,000, just over 2,000 U.S. dollars equivalent, and private cash transactions of no more than just a little over $4,000 immediately, and then lower limits later on. So in other words, gradually get the people off of cash transactions, especially large cash transactions. If governments are successful in enforcing a cashless society, they will not only have control of taxation, but they will also be in a position to enforce anything else on their citizens that they desire. Just the threat of freezing assets will be a powerful persuader for most people. That's why you've got to be dependent on Christ. You can't depend on the banking system. And by the way, Israel is the only seventh-day Sabbath-keeping nation on the planet. Do you think perhaps that nation will be one of the first to enforce a worship law? <laughs> Don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I just think it's ironic you see, the enemy loves to use the very ones who were once God's people on the earth to fulfill his will now. He doesn't care if Jews keep the Sabbath. Well, he does, but he knows that if he doesn't have their hearts with Christ, they will comply with whatever the laws of the world will enforce on them. 
In just the last few years, Italy made cash transactions over $1,000, or pardon me, 1,000 euros illegal. Switzerland proposed banning cash transactions in excess of 100,000 francs. Russia banned transactions, cash transactions over $10,000. Spain banned cash transactions over 2,500 euros. Mexico made cash payments of more than 200,000 pesos illegal. Uruguay banned cash transactions over $5,000. And France made cash transactions over $1,000 illegal, down from the previous limit of 3,000 euros. I'm sorry, I meant 1,000 euros <clears throat> in France. It used to be 3,000 euros. Now it's dropped down to 1,000. These are just some of the cashless moves that have been made around the world in recent times. National governments are not the only governments moving against cash. Even cities are involved. Bergamo, Italy, is testing methods by which it can, all, as a city, go cashless. And like in Scandinavia, Amsterdam is nearly cashless now as well. In Kenya, there is a payment system that allows millions of unbanked citizens to store digital cash on their phones and transfer it to anyone by text. Kenya. What does unbanked mean? It means someone that doesn't have a bank account. And by the way, Zimbabwe is similar with its own economic ecosystem. And there are many others. Cash is being regulated to second-class status. Well, my friends, Revelation 13, verses 15 to 17, tells us that a time is coming when worship laws will be enforced by penalties against the use of cash or digital or any other type of transaction. Revelation 14 says that if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So the choice is yours. You can choose whomever you want to serve, whomever you want to worship. If you worship money, you will end up worshiping the papacy. If you worship Christ, then you'll be eliminated from the central principles of your society. In other words, you'll be dependent completely on Christ. In the time of crisis, that's coming as an overwhelming surprise. I don't know about you, but I need Christ. I need Jesus in my life, and I need Christ in my soul so that I am totally reliant on Him and will not fear when they come after me in, in an economic way, with economic sanctions for my faithfulness to Jesus Christ. My friends, He's the example... And, he, and Christ is at the central, is the central issue in the last days. He overcame the enemy on the same ground that we must overcome. Here is his words to Satan in the wilderness. Luke chapter 4, verses 6 through 8 says, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and whomsoever I will give it. If thou wilt therefore worship me, all shall be thine. He was offering Jesus economic incentives and power incentives to worship himself. And that's exactly what he offers us today. You'll be able to survive in this world if you worship Satan, if you follow his plan. But if you follow the plan that Christ is on, you'll be poverty struck, but you'll be rich in eternal weight of glory. And that's what I'm looking forward to. Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt not, no, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And later on he said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This is the contest for which the nations are now preparing. It's the same crisis that Jesus faced in the wilderness. And it's powerfully connected to the economy, just as Jesus was, or the crisis that Jesus faced. 
Here's a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 423 to 425. Fearful is the issue to which the world is to be brought. The powers of earth, uniting to war against the commandments of God, will decree that no man may buy or sell, save he that has the mark of the beast, and finally, that whosoever refuses to receive the mark shall be put to death. Well, friends, conscientious objection to the word of God will be treated as rebellion. Are you ready for that? Remember the statement that says, and I don't have it in my Bible at the moment, but when we reach the standard that God has for his people to reach, Seventh-day Adventists will be considered to be extreme. Uh, no, they'll be considered to be singul odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. That's how she puts it. I don't know about you. I'd rather be considered an extremist or odd or straight-laced on this earth rather than in rebellion to the God of heaven. May God bless you, my brothers and sisters, and help us to bring our lives into harmony with Christ in every way. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the love of Christ. Thank you for the warning that we received from his word concerning the times in which we live. And as we see the cashless society looming in the near future, we pray that you will give us the courage to live by our convictions and unite with Christ in all things. That we may depend, be dependent totally on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray and thank you. Amen.